Okay, all right. Over to you, Dr. Murli. Right. So uh, there are two ways we can do this. I, you know, I could invite questions uh, right from the beginning, so y'all can stop and ask me questions. Uh, my only worry is then it may take a long time. So I'll leave it to you. If you think some question is very important, y'all can either note it down and ask it at the end, or because it may come up in the future uh, in the slides I present, or if you want to stop, you think it's important enough to stop and ask me, please go ahead. You know, we can do it both ways. I'm going to take you through what happens in COVID and very little at the end on, uh, you know, the treatment. Uh, but more importantly, I think I want you all to feel free to ask questions uh, and clear doubts, which is what Shibu told me uh, is the main aim of this whole uh, exercise. Um, COVID has been with us for a long time. So... We've suffered it, we've suffered the effects of it, we've suffered the lockdown. Uh, but let's, let's learn a little more about it so we can, uh, we can see how we are going to manage this condition uh, and how we're going to manage the next few months at least of the second wave and then hopefully be prepared for a third wave. Uh, the title, of course, uh, comes from this quotation by Winston Churchill. He said, I cannot forecast to you the action of Russia. It's a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma, but perhaps there's a key. And I think that describes Russia very well. Um, and the same applies to COVID. We've learned so much about this condition in the last year and a half, but we've also learned that there is so much that we got wrong in the first place, and we continue to learn about it. So, we can't tell you what's going to happen with COVID. The virus is changing faster than us. It's faster, it's changing faster than we can learn. But yet it's been an enormous learning process. And I think we've done pretty well in terms of the science and the medicine of it. The virus itself belongs to a group of respiratory viruses. So that's why it enters through the nose, throat and lungs. And it's named Corona because of the crown-like spikes on their surface. And that spike is very important because that's what enables it to attach to the cells on the surface of the nose, the throat, the airways, and going all the way down into the lungs. But we actually have a very similar lining of the gut also, though it seems very different. And so it can also enter through the gut uh, and can produce gut symptoms. But by far the commonest mode of spread is through the lungs. Why is it called COVID-19? It comes from obviously an acronym for coronavirus disease from 2019. But the way it's changing, it's mutating frequently, it's acquiring new qualities. I'm wondering whether it's changed so much we should start calling it COVID-21 and maybe in next year, 22. So it can keep changing fairly rapidly. The coronavirus is nothing new. It's been circulating for decades among humans and causes a range of diseases, about 30% percent of common cold is due to the coronavirus. Not the same coronavirus, but related coronaviruses. And we're in fact using one of these uh, viruses, co common cold, not a coronavirus, an adenovirus, to give us the vaccine like COVID shield. It can also become something very severe, severe like MERS coronavirus and the SARS coronavirus that came in 2002 and 2010 or 2009. Uh, which also caused very severe disease. But fortunately, though it was predicted to become a pandemic, never became a pandemic. Who's at risk of infection? Virtually everyone. And I think we know from our experience at Arbors that virtually anybody can get infected. Uh, the results of most of these I'll come to, uh, but the symptoms start after a few days. So there's an incubation period. An incubation period can be anywhere from two days to 17 days. Typically it happens with between two and five days, but it can be as late as 17 days. And then the symptoms start and we usually use call that day one. And that's very important. People should recognize what is the first symptom. Most people talk about fever as being their first symptom. They talk about when they get a bad throat or when they start to become breathless, but that's not the first symptom. It's very important to recognize that the first time people feel a bit unwell, you know, I'm a little under the weather, feeling more tired than I usually do. Normally I'm a bundle of energy, but you know, I'm just flagging towards, you know, the morning itself, I'm feeling so tired. That is day one. 
and the person can be infective for at least two days before the symptoms start. And that's important to remember. The first phase, the first five or six days, the person is highly infectious because they're spreading the virus they, when they talk, when they cough, when they sing. And remember that many patients can be symptomatic and spreading this highly infectious stage can start before the symptoms start. Between day seven and 10, they continue to be infectious, but practically all patients become non-infectious by day 10. Only the ones who have very severe disease may continue to be infectious. People who have been immunosuppressed for whatever reason may be infectious for a longer period. The problem is you're most contagious when your symptoms are minimal. And that's when people are moving around, talking, blowing on their birthday candles, talking to neighbors. And that's really only when they become really sick, when they get tested. So this period when they are highly contagious is when they are asymptomatic. And these timelines are key to the choice of treatment. It's very, very important when we're talking to doctors to recall when was the first day I started to feel ill, okay? And that decides our treatment. I'm not gonna go into this except this is the virus as it's multiplying. And then as I said, by about day 10, it's starting to come down. Person's symptoms start later. Initially it's mild or moderate. Then it becomes severe and becomes critical. And this red line here is the antibodies. That's the immune substances your body pumps out to fight off the virus. And generally, it sees off the virus in most patients in the mild to moderate stage. By the time a person becomes severely ill, the antibodies have increased hugely and the number of viruses has started to come down hugely. Notice that as the antibodies start to increase, around about there, the viruses start to come down. Okay, so it's postulated that most of the damage, most of this illness is severity, is associated with the body's response to it, its reaction to it. Having a problem? Okay. Uh, and when you become critical is when things re really get bad. And that's when people become extremely short of breath. They go into a lung damage and they need to get into the ICU. And that happens after about day 10. And that's the big problem here. Lines come across. Anyway, uh, so this is the typical progression. A person starts with an infection which may last two to 14 days, the incubation period, but an average of five days, as I mentioned earlier. 80%, four in five people are mild, moderate, or even asymptomatic. They just don't know they have symptoms. As much as 40% can be asymptomatic. And the problem is these people spread infection. When the symptoms arrive, it's typically with a fever or a cough. And only about 15% of cases go on to become more severe. And the difficulty in breathing starts when the antibodies start to increase around day five. After about one to two weeks, most people have a resolution of, complete, uh, the, of their symptoms. And hospital admission usually therefore occurs only around day seven to day 11. Now, this is the time in the first one week where we have to use antivirals because that's when the virus is increasing. After day seven, the antivirals don't have much of a role, though we do give them because between day seven and day 10, we can kill off the virus and take care of the inflammation from the body. Then we can hopefully control the infection. As long as the virus is there, it's triggering off more and more antibodies. So up to about day nine or day 10, it's still useful to use the antiviral treatments that I'll come to later. But this is the time when the body's immunity is also starting to cause a problem. Most people can get discharged despite the severe infection in one to two weeks. And most of them don't end up in the ICU, but about 5% of patients are critical. In our experience, about 2% go into the ICU, end up on a ventilator. That's usually around day 10 to day 12. And patients who die typically die around day 18 to 30. We've pushed it now. We keep them longer and many people are able to come out between day 13, uh, day 18 and day 30. But this is the dangerous phase between day 10 and day 30. So what are the early symptoms? Everybody knows fever is common. You can have respiratory symptoms. You can have cough, sore throat and a runny nose. There are a lot of non-lung symptoms and fatigue is the most common. You know, people just feel extremely tired and want to lie in bed. You can also have headache, body ache, diarrhea, which is becoming more and more common in the second wave. Nausea and vomiting, 
Loss of smell and taste, everybody recognizes. And of course, conjunctivitis or pink eye is something that's come up more commonly in the second wave. The late stage, and this is the worrying stage, because these are fairly common in the early stage. And as I said, 80% of people get wetter without any problem. However, in the late stage, the fever has subsided and then the fever comes back. Or the cough, which was there, maybe it went away or and then came back or it got worse and worse. Or a person now starts to get more and more breathless. Those are worrying symptoms. That's the late stage. That's the stage when the antibodies are kicking in. The various non-lung features and some patients who are asymptomatic, unfortunately, can end up with non-lung features. So heart attacks, strokes, clots in the leg veins. In fact, clots anywhere is a classic feature of COVID-19. And very often in patients unexpectedly develop strokes or heart attacks, and you check them for a recent or a past COVID infection, you'll find this very, very commonly. Everybody knows this joke. We've, it's been doing the rounds. The wife forgot to put salt in the poha and en the entire family went for the RT-PCR. And it seems a bit funny that you lose smell and taste, but there are two things about it. One is it's very good because most people who have loss of smell and taste actually do very well. They tend not to go into the severe or critical illness. And that seems to be fairly clear both in the first wave and remains reasonably true in the second wave also, though it's not completely true in the second wave. But it can last a long time. And there are people, the French wine tasters and the French chefs who developed COVID have been virtually suicidal because they've lost some of their most important senses, smell and taste, to cook or to carry out their wine tasting wine activities. So how contagious and deadly is it? We don't know still, but it seems to be in this range. What we call the R0 is between 1.5 and 3.5. That is, it spreads from one person to one and a half to three and a half people on average. And the fatality rate is about 0.7 to 1.5% in India, depending on the age and where the person is. In the West, especially in Europe and America, it was around 3.5%. So we've actually been doing well compared to them. A lot of theories why this happens and no definite answers. And as I said earlier, about four in five infections is mild and less than 5% are critical. And most patients recover very well. And those over 80 are at the greatest risk. So the mortality rates in those over 80, unfortunately nobody in, uh, in Arbors is above 80, is one in six. Recall that even in the plus 80s, the death rate is one in six, five out of six will recover. So despite all that we worry about COVID-19 and we should worry, the vast majority still do well. And as the age comes down, people do better and better. And in the 10 to 20 group, it's one in 500. So most people do well. Now this was in the first wave. We don't really believe that this is true of the second wave. And in the second wave, the severity of illness is shifting more towards this age group between 10 and 50. And we are seeing more deaths in this group also. We're also starting to see more and more children get affected. And there's a great fear, not proven, that it may affect children in the third wave that is expected to come. So the data comes from Wuhan in China. The lung health is poor and the smoking rates are high. So these actually are not as high in India. We certainly have lower rates than in they did in Wuhan. And among those with existing conditions, if they have a heart disease, one in 10 in, of any age, one in 10 would have serious ailment, ailments and die. Diabetes is the other risk. And of course, chronic respiratory disease. So those are some of the very important things. Very strangely, people with lung disease, people with asthma, people with smoking induced damage to lung COPD, strangely, we were expecting the worst from this group, but actually doing extremely well. And I'll come back to this if questions need are. Uh, come up about this later. So this was yesterday's figures. The world, we have huge numbers. Let's not worry about numbers. This is India's numbers. And what is heartening is after the first wave, we had a horrible second wave, which really peaked very, very rapidly. But what we've seen over the last 14 days is it's come down by 35%. The mortalities continue to rise, but this is largely fueled by the initial peak and will also come down over the next couple of weeks. So clearly it's, we are doing better now than we were two weeks ago. Uh, 
Arborites who rang me up asking for beds for relatives. We used to struggle to get beds. Uh, now it's not so bad. We actually have some beds, though the ICUs are still chock full. Uh, Karnataka is doing a little better than it was two weeks ago, and we've actually done better than Tamil Nadu. Uh, last two weeks ago, Tamil Nadu was much better than we are. So they're, the wave, like all waves, spread from Maharashtra into Karnataka and is now going towards Tamil Nadu. So that is the worry. The problem for me is waves, as anybody who stood on a beach knows, the wave comes back and the undertow can often be worse. So we need to expect this to happen. Let's not be complacent with what is happening now. Why is there breathing difficulty? Because both the lungs get affected. Initially, it may be infective. Later, the immune damage leads to a condition called ARDS. So what should one do? Now that we know a little bit of COVID-19 and you know how it cause, causes problems, we go back to the plague doctors. And you know they say the more things change, the more they remain the same. This was 17th, 18th century uh, Europe when you had the plague doctor. And this is what the plague doctor used to wear. You know, a thick coat, he used to have this bundle of herbs around him, he used to have herbs in that beak-like projection, he used to wear glasses to protect himself and carry this wand. So this was the anatomy of a plague doctor and things haven't changed very much. Superficially, it looks like there is a change. But 2020, 2021, we are back to where we were in terms of what the doctor has to wear. So you suspect you have COVID for any of those symptoms, or if you are in close contact with somebody who's tested positive for COVID, what test do you do? There are three possible tests. One is an RT-PCR. The second is a true NAT or a CB NAT. And all these look at the virus RNA. We're trying to pick up on the virus RNA. And that's a very, very specific test. If it's positive, it's positive. The antigen test looks at the proteins that the virus produces, particularly the spike protein, which is what helps it to latch on to the cell. And all these tests have a very high rate of specificity. That means if they are positive, they are positive. If they are negative, on the other hand, they don't mean very much, okay? And I'll come back to this. So if you're positive by any method, do not retest. Don't have any doubts and say, maybe it's wrong, maybe it's this. A positive test is a positive test, whether you have symptoms or not. However, if you have classic symptoms and you're negative, you may have to repeat the test again later, maybe in two, three, five days. Okay, because the test which is initially negative may become positive later and may have to be confirmed if there is any doubt. But these days, if we are strongly suspicious that the person is positive, even oh, sorry, that is infected, even if the test is negative, we would start treatment or keep them under very close observation and advise them to isolate themselves. And as I said, there is a window of false negatives. The test is negative, but it's wrongly negative. It should actually be positive. And this is because before symptoms, you have a very high rate of positivity. But after symptoms, I showed you the virus load comes down. That's the blue line. The chances of picking up the virus become much smaller. So the test can be negative while actually the person is heading into the more severe phases of disease. I also told you that very often patients tend to see us after seven days or eight days for various reasons. Let's not go into it. But this is the time when the virus load is already coming down. So the test has a very high chance of being negative. So don't rely only on the tests. So this is the window of testing that we speak about. Let's not go into it again. But if you test positive for COVID-19, what should you do? First of all, stay home. Pandemics spread because of contact with others. So if you don't go to public areas, the chances that you will spread it to those 1.5 to 3.5 people comes down. Take rest and get hydrated, stay hydrated and take over the counter medicines. That's very, very important. Paracetamol or also known as acetaminophen makes you feel better, makes you feel less tired, brings down the temperature so you can take it. I usually prefer to leave it only when the temperature crosses 101 because the fever gives us some valuable information about how the person is doing. So if it's very, very uncomfortable, take it. Otherwise, don't take anything. Just rest, hydrate yourself. Very important. Stay in touch with your doctor. Extremely, extremely important. Okay, because we've known people, especially doctors who've decided to stay at home, stay out of touch, and they come only when they are critical. So 
separate yourself from other people at home. So you're staying at home, stay in a specific room, isolate yourself completely, get your food supplied to the room, stay away from the pets in the room because pets have been shown to get infected. We don't know if they carry infection to others, but remember this came from possibly bats via other uh, mammals into human beings. So it's possible that they can spread in infection. So if you have an infection, keep your pet away from you. Social distancing, we all know the seek social distancing. So let's not worry. A distance optimally of six feet, minimum three meters. I'm sorry, this shouldn't be three feet. It's three meters from a person who's sneezing or coughing and maybe even longer. Unfortunately, we are not as disciplined as say the Chinese or the, or the uh, Koreans are, we have no concept of queuing. If you must order food from outside, order a takeaway. Okay, this was a very nice case reported from China right in the beginning where they showed three families sitting on adjacent tables. This was the index patient down here. And that index patient, when he uh, infected others, that's this, this one down there, you can see a tiny circle around him, I hope was able to infect many others in the adjacent tables, okay? But in the tables far away from him, nobody got infected. And why it happened was there was a flow of uh, air conditioning which carried it to his table away from him and then circulated and back into the intake, whereas the adjacent tables didn't get it because they had a separate air conditioner. So air result transmission can happen in any indoor space but it occurs more in crowded and poorly ventilated spaces. So extremely important that you avoid places where other people come. So of course, we all know this, wash hands frequently, correctly, use hand sanitizer and your hand sanitizer must have at least 70% alcohol. The herbs and other things in it don't really matter, though we love to think herbals are very good for us. Very important that you know how to wash, okay? So though I know all of you know, I'm going to take you through it again. Wash with soap and water. Okay, this is not the hand sanitizer, this is soap and water. First wash palm to palm. And you know, I think Shibu will tell you better and Hema will tell you better and Saurabh will tell you better because the surgeons do this day in and day out. Wash between the fingers. Okay, so in between the fingers, back of the hands, front of the hands, then focus on the thumbs, rotate your thumbs, then run the back of the hands also. Focus on the wrist because that's where the dirt collects. And then finally, you wipe it with a clean disposable towel if you're in the OT or at home, frequently change the towels. Okay, fomite transmission from surfaces doesn't appear to be important. That's important to remember. Okay, in the first phase, we thought it was a huge problem. It doesn't seem to be as huge a problem now, but it's still, and I would advise caution in the second wave, because the virus appears to be stickier and stickier as this uh, wave goes on. So maybe the rules that applied in the first phase don't apply in the second phase. But still, aerosol and droplet infections are the so most this is common. This shot. It's a thousand as, frames as this a second, which you. is roughly 40 times slower than how it appeared in real time. And I just counted from one to four. Those are the numbers you can see at the bottom of the screen. And I was blown away at the amount of particles that came out of my mouth, not only from the spit, sort of at the beginning of each word, but after I'm done with the word, particularly the word for, you can see like a fine mist come out of my mouth. And that was actually really surprising. I could see that with, with the naked eye, the particles that are so light that they don't fall. And I wasn't even shouting that loud. That was like a medium volume of talking there. Yeah, I think- So I'm gonna cut that. That is Fauci agreeing with that, but basically, just counting numbers makes a very big difference. When you're talking itself, it spreads. And what you saw were droplets. We can't really see the aerosols very well, but some of those droplets will uh, evaporate, become smaller, and that's really what an aerosol is. A uh, droplet is something which is over five microns in size, and an aerosol is less than five microns in size, so it can remain suspended in the air for a long time. So in a closed room, it can easily spread through Brownian motion from where the person is speaking to the other side. And it's just with speaking. Imagine what happens when you're speaking loudly, when you're shouting, when you're singing. Okay, so that's why it's extremely important to wear a mask. The next part of that video actually showed how when you use a mask, this gets cut down hugely. That's why masks are extremely important. So the 
Q is avoid close contact with people who are sick and stay home if you're sick. What should you do when you're at home? You monitor the oxygen, you monitor the heart rate, and you monitor the temperature at least thrice daily. My rule is every six hours. Use a triple layered mask when you open the door. Keep in touch with your doctor. Stay in touch with your family, but stay isolated from them. Stay well hydrated. Continue to do light exercise. We know the blood becomes extremely sticky and clots. If you're just lying in bed all day, your blood is likely to clot in the legs and then spread into the lungs. Of course, eat healthy. And don't forget to continue your blood pressure, heart, whatever medications you have, and continue to check your BP and your sugar and so on. I showed you earlier that people who have diabetes, especially uncontrolled diabetes, do worse than people who don't have diabetes or whose sugar is well controlled. We've all heard of this, how to cover your nose and mouth when you cough or sneeze. So don't use a tissue. If you do use a tissue, dispose of it carefully but and wash your hands immediately. But of course, cough into your elbow is what is usually advised. Okay, and this is dramatically brought out in this, how it spreads very rapidly and spitting is certainly to be avoided. Okay, that is dubbed a horror story and you know, you can make, make out how horrible it was. So as I said, when should you specifically seek medical help? If you have fever, a troublesome cough and shortness of breath, seek medical help. They can give you something to help with these symptoms. And as I said, it's very important to keep monitoring the temperature and oxygen saturation. But what are these action points? If the fever recurs after subsiding for a few days, or if the fever persists beyond day five to seven, extremely important to see the doctor because a drop in the temperature and after day seven, it comes back or starts to rise then it tells you that the immune reaction is happening. What we call the cytokine storm may be in starting to occur. The other cue is your oxygen saturation. The oxygen saturation drops below 94% at rest or between rest and a six minute walk, it drops by 3% or more. That's the time you need to con contact your doctor and consider going into hospital straight away. We now know that that is the time we it is critical to introduce medications and introduce medications early. So even if you've not taken medications in the first few days, and as I said, 80% will get better without need for any medication. It's very important that you consider using this as the opportunity to get in and start your treatment immediately. So how do you check the saturation? You do it with a pulse oximeter. So it's fairly simple. And it's very important to know that on one side, you have the saturation, and on the other side, you have the pulse rate. And unless you get a good pulse wave, a pulse oximeter doesn't work. So you need to get it on the proper finger. So use it either on the index or the middle finger. That is what is ideally advised. Don't keep moving your hands around. And if for any reason your hands are cold, warm them up nicely before you check the oxygen saturation. We've had people panic because they said oxygen was 65 when actually it's their pulse rate. Go into hospital and, you know, uh, Pratima was staying up until two o'clock trying to arrange a bed for somebody to get into hospital when I think they were actually looking at their pulse rate and panicking. The other thing is if you don't get a good pulse wave, you're likely to get a wrong reading on the pulse oximeter. And three, if possible, invest in a good pulse oximeter. I saw a dramatic picture of a person with five pulse oximeters on the five fingers, each showing a completely different value. And I think you've probably seen pulse oximeters showing pulse rates and saturations on cookies. Okay, so I think we need to be careful about what kind of pulse oximeter we are buying. Critical is double masking. When you come into a place where there is a potential for infection, for example, when you're going for your vaccination, please double masks. We know that vaccine centers have been associated with spread of infection had a lot of patients who went in for their vaccine, three or four days later, start to develop symptoms and go into very, very bad in, uh, infection. The vaccine takes at least two weeks to work. So that's not vaccination in, induced. Four days later, if the person still has fever and cough, it's probably an infection. A lot of these people have picked up in the vaccination center because they don't take precautions. They don't maintain distance. They don't keep their mask on. Uh, they keep pushing the mask, opening it, touching their faces and putting the mask back on. 
So when you use a double mask, one of the masks should be a disposable mask, and that is what you first put on. And ideally, what you need to do is you twist the, if it is the kind that has a loop, you twist the loop and put it around your ears so that you get an even tighter fit. But a disposable mask doesn't really give you a very tight fit. It does leak from above and below. So you cover that with a cloth mask and a cloth mask actually gives you a good fit and you can pull it down and you can adjust it so that you get a very good fit. If you can put on your specs and take a look and your specs messed up, that means the fit is not good. Okay, but as if you use a double mask and you use it in this order, the disposable mask below and the uh, cloth mask above, that actually works over 85% of cases it can reduce or infection it can or the transmission it can reduce. It protects you and it protects the other person. And the second mask should actually push the inner mask against the face and keep it tight. You don't need to use a double mask if you're using an N95. You can use it with a shield, and this is particularly important for the surgeons and anesthetists that they can use a shield all the time, but also for physicians who talk to patients. In fact, we talk to patients more, uh, but they, you know, that's when a shield becomes useful, but for the surgeon, it becomes ex extremely important. Uh, I, I don't know about the surgeons here, but I used to see my brother-in-law, Bhaskar, come back from the OT with speckles of blood on his specs, okay, without even knowing that, you know, He's got these tiny specks of blood. So it can spread. So please use a mask, double mask and a shield. An N95 mask, you don't need to double mask. It doesn't make a difference really. An N95 is so-called because it can cut down 95% of the particles. A double mask is cutting, cuts down 85% of the particles plus. Okay, and of course, jocularly to show you that this is the only right way to use a mask. Uh, and a double mask does not mean one on the forehead and one under the chin. The probability of contagion if both people are wearing masks is extremely low. So even if this person is coughing a lot, the spread is much less. If neither is wearing a mask, it's very high. If only you're wearing a mask, but the other person is not who's infected, the probability of contagion is still high. So you've got to insist that people who come into your house wear a mask. And remember that this happens not only with coughing, but also with speaking. When the person is wearing a mask, and you're not wearing a mask, your risk is medium, okay? So it's not low. Both are masks, the risk is very low, which is why we still encourage people to wear masks in the United States because of the vaccination, widespread use of vaccines. If everybody is vaccinated, you can stop wearing a mask when there's a low risk of transmission of infection. A lot of people are interested in CT scans. They get demands, why are you not doing a CT scan? I tell people not to do a CT scan. They've gone and got a CT scan. CT scans have no role in mild disease. They give you unnecessary radiation. They don't contribute to the care. We don't change our treatment because of the CT scan. We only do it when the test is negative, the initial test that I spoke about, but you still have a very strong suspicion of COVID because we can very often pick up on the CT scan Fairly typical features, we call that a CORADS-5, and we can start treatment based on that. We can also do it if the person's getting rapid worse, rapidly worse, and the RT-PCR has still not come, and we are very keen to you know, move them into the right place and start treatment. And of course, in moderate to severe disease, we can do it, though really it's not necessary. I don't usually ask for CT scans unless I'm, I think there are some complications of COVID or something else which is also complicating COVID, like a blood clot in the lungs. I manage most of my patients without a CT scan. Unfortunately, by the time they come to see me, they've already had one or two scans. And you know, you feel really bad about asking a person for a third scan when they develop a complication. So please don't do CT scans. We've just submitted a letter to the Journal of the American Medical Association, JAMA, saying, please don't ask for scans. Please uh, you know, spread this message. What is the treatment we do? Treatments have come and gone. You know, we had the famous HCQS. In India sending uh, HCQS to Trump under threat and so on. All these treatments have been proven not to really work. Ivermectin, I would actually move to this. This, uh, you know, the official statement is that Ivermectin doesn't work. We are very, very happy with the combination of Ivermectin and doxycycline. The only things that have been proven to work are steroids in the later phases, that is after day five to seven when the oxygen starts dropping or the fever comes back, which is why you need to see your doctor and why you need to monitor temperature and oxygen. 
in the early phase, we use an inhaler, the budesonide inhaler. Blood thinners do make a difference. When people are quite sick, remdesivir does seem to make a difference. And after all the initial poo-pooing by the Americans and the WHO and so on, most people now agree that it's useful and it's made its appearance in the uh, AIMS protocol also. And it's long held a place in our protocol and we give it all the time. The antibody cocktail is a new thing. It got a lot of publicity when Trump went in quite sick and immediately came out within a couple of days. Uh, and we are introducing it. Narayana, we're going to get it very soon. And it's to be used only in the first three to five days, preferably in the first three days when the person's oxygen is still normal. Putting, giving it later may actually complicate things worse. And there's a group of drugs that seem to be working. We will believe our government and our DRDO when they say the 2-DEG is working. That's the 2-deoxyglucose. We don't really know if it works. Vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc may have no role, but it seems to improve overall immunity. So we do prescribe it, but we tell people you don't need to carry it on for as long as we used to in the beginning. So for mild disease, symptomatic therapies are usually enough but we don't know who's going to remain mild. There are about one in five who will get worse. So we believe that you start them with a mild treatment like ivermectin and doxycycline. But the important thing is hydration and normal diet. And you know, these days, these are buzzwords, decluttering and minimalism in the lifestyle we adopt. And we need to adopt the same uh, buzzwords when we come to treatment of COVID also. Very important. The big game changer everyone expects is vaccines. And what do vaccines actually do? It reduces disease, but not infection. And what's the difference? When you get an infection, you have the virus, you have the virus multiplying, but it does not go out of control. So if you're talking about asymptomatic infections in blue, about 40%, as we mentioned earlier, of patients with uh, COVID have an asymptomatic infection. And about 70 to 80% have either asymptomatic or mild infection. Out of the remaining 20 to 30%, most will have moderate disease and only a small minority have severe disease. On the other hand, when you have a vaccine, you may have an infection, but most of them, close to 80% will have only an asymptomatic infection. About 10 to 20% will have a mild infection and about 10% have moderate infection and virtually no one has severe disease. We certainly haven't come across more than a few people, a handful of people with severe disease. And these are people who've had other comorbid disease. A person who's previously healthy, we've never had develop a severe disease and die of it. So very, very important. It seems to prevent severe disease and almost definitely prevents death. So let's not go into the vaccines, but these are the American vaccines and the German vaccine. These are what we have. This is Covishield. This is the... Bharat Biotech Covaxin. And what we have right now is we have the Covishield and Covaxin. And very soon we are getting Sputnik V, probably within a month or so. And there are various good things. But the important thing to remember is this paradox of Buridan's ass. I'm sure people have come across it. If you put a, a, a rational, a completely rational donkey between two piles, equally attractive piles of hay, this case, they've used in a pile of water and a COVID shield uh, and a pile of hay. It's actually when Burudan described it to his two equally attractive piles of hay and the donkey would starve to death because it wouldn't know which way to go. Unfortunately, this is the same thing people are doing. Should I take COVID shield? Could I take Covaxin? Either, whichever is available is fine. And we'll take this up if there are questions about this. Smoking and alcohol, I'm not going to go into it, but strictly a no-no because it increases your risk of getting infection. It increases the risk of severe infection and it increases your risk of not coming out because of other complications which will happen when you get, uh, when you're a smoker. Alcohol certainly uh, in limited account, amount shouldn't produce a problem, but the key word is limited amounts. What happens after you recover from COVID? The problem is you can have what is called long COVID. Okay, so Fever usually subsides. There's a tiny minority who feel feverish, but when they check their temperatures, don't have a problem. They feel alternately hot and cold. And I've had patients describe that months later, they feel feverish in one part of the body and another part is feeling chill. And family tell me that then they touch, for example, the forehead, the person feel warm, but the chest is, looking, is feeling cold. So that kind of temperature variation is known. 
loss of disturbance of sense of taste happens in almost 30 to 60 percent of people still i can't take the call please and that may persist for about 10 percent up to six months after covid 19 headache dry cough loss of smell uh, myalgia muscle aches and pains feeling chill as i mentioned earlier still feeling breathless in about 15 percent of people up to six months later and various other symptoms one of the things that not that's not described is very specific psychiatric changes which include anxiety people just get very anxious whether it's a post-traumatic disorder or a specific change in the brain is not very clear but it looks like that's something very specific that it changes something in the brain a friend one of my very close friends who has handled both the first wave and the second wave in london a former student of mine described that he just couldn't remember people's names He'd remember everything. He was running his wards perfectly well. He's the clinical lead in pulmonology in King's College in London. But he just couldn't remember people's name, people he knew pretty well. A very, very specific memory loss. So the funny things that happen, people describe something called brain fog. All kinds of anxiety symptoms, depressive symptoms, but all these go away in anywhere from a few weeks to a few months. Important thing to remember is though post-COVID lasts for some time, it all gets better. Okay, so let's not get too worried about it. Uh, Post-COVID is a true problem, but the good thing is practically everybody gets better at varying periods of time. The other thing to remember about long COVID or the post-COVID syndrome is even people who had mild COVID seem to have problems later. Okay, so it need not only be those who had severe disease who developed long COVID, even people with mild disease who managed at home have developed long COVID. I'll stop and invite questions, but I'll leave you with this very profound saying by Donald Rumsfeld. It invited a lot of laughs, but the more you think about it, he was actually right. He said there are known knowns. These are things that we know we know. There are known unknowns. That is to say, there are things we know we don't know, and that's particularly true of a lot of COVID, but there are also unknown unknowns. These are things we don't know we don't know, and that's what we've learned over the last few months. There were things we thought, okay, we don't know about these, uh, but we know that we don't know. But there are new things that keep popping up in COVID-19. And therefore, there are still a lot of unknown unknowns, as Donald, Rums, uh, Donald Rumsfeld said. As nasty a person as Churchill, with whose quotation we started, but they did make some true statements. So I'll stop. Churchill, anyway, we should never leave without Churchill's quotations. He said, never let a good crisis go to waste. So a lot of us have benefited also from this and it's given us new occupations. We've learned cooking, we've learned baking, we've read a lot, we've enjoyed music that we never thought we would. We found time for these things that we would never otherwise have found. So let's not let a good crisis go to waste. Please use the, uh, you know, the rest of the second wave optimally to keep yourself healthy, to fight off COVID, even if you're exposed to it maintain all precautions and i'll stop and invite questions at this problem uh, at this point thank you dr murli that is really enlightening i think you covered pretty much everything that most people would want to know about and uh, if you can stop the screen sharing then we'll uh, yeah, just head it into that yeah, yeah yeah okay so what we can do is uh, Let's change this view to gallery view. Okay. So I'll start with, uh, I'll go in the order of the, okay, Prasad wants to, he's great, got his hand raised. Yeah. Okay, Prasad, go for it. Go. Can, I, can I also, Prasad, before you say anything, invite the other doctors in this panel to add their opinions, yeah. uh, you know, expert opinions, uh, okay. disagreements if they have any, okay. and share their experiences, you know, so... You want please, me to raise? Can they do that, or you, you're asking them to join in on this quest Q and A? They they can join in on the question and answer uh, while you go ahead, Prasad. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, the handicapped uh, group of doctors you have here, uh, the two who are sitting here are complete wasted surgeons, <laughs> and uh, the and one I've who also knowledge been put out to is, uh, oh no, Hema is there. She can gas. Yeah. It. No, no, I also have nothing to add, sir. It was pretty exhaustive. Just wanted to say that. So, uh, only can, person if, who can contribute is Ishtiak. I don't know where he is. You know, he's the only sensible guy here. 
if uh, <laughs> so sarab so nailed that and i can i request everybody to put on their uh, videos and uh, those who want to ask questions can raise their hand once prasad is done or i'll just go one by one through each of the tiles so okay. uh, may i may i go ahead yes yeah, go ahead prasad yeah okay doc uh, murli that was outstanding i mean such clarity uh and very very thankful to you uh, i have a question on something that has been bothering me particularly amongst those who have not yet been affected and maybe that's one thing uh, you didn't cover but i have been reading about this large number of immuno boosters which are placebos which do nothing and people are chasing buying all these immuno boosters and consuming them thinking that they're going to raise their immunity levels and not get covid so i want your comment on that and your advice you know i i agree completely they are a waste they are a placebo uh, the placebo effect is not to be sneezed at you know it's sometimes very useful if used correctly hmm. but uh, but but yeah i agree don't go chasing around for immune boosters they don't i think nothing works as well as a good diet and exercise they are the best immune boosters of all uh, and of course uh, you know the roll of zinc and all those that we used to use does help vitamin d undoubtedly helps fight off infection we know that people who have low vitamin d's are at more risk of infection of all kinds especially tuberculosis we know uh, and that's you know that's in fact this is a recommendation for everybody there's this brilliant book called survival of the sickest if you all can read it read it it's a very readable book but it tells you how sickness survives because it helps people survive okay and one of the things it tells us is that vitamin d helps fight off tuberculosis and you know that we all came out of africa we were all dark skin to start with and as we moved northwards where the light is poorer and the vitamin d is therefore less produced if you have a very dark skin it was a survival advantage to have lighter skin and lighter skin and even lighter skin which is why skins become lighter the more northward we go and that enables you to produce more vitamin d and therefore survive tuberculosis if you were dark skinned you didn't survive tb if you were light skinned you survived tb and this book is all about similar things that you know where a genetic defect survives because that genetic defect helps survival so uh, basically vitamin d does help so please make sure indians are extremely low in vitamin d so there's absolutely no harm in taking a monthly dose of 60000 units of vitamin d okay that will meet your daily requirement plus a little more okay uh, if you are deficient in vitamin d you can take it weekly in the beginning and then switch to monthly after 8 weeks but you know i'm i'm happy enough because vitamin d in excess is also dangerous i'm perfectly happy for people to take one immediately and then take once a month it's likely to meet your needs the other zinc big questions being asked about it we don't know if it contributes to future problems so we usually give it for about a week to 15 days and then stop it vitamin c is a very good antioxidant so whether it helps or not it certainly helps to reduce some of the oxidative damage in the lungs the rest of it is all bunk up honestly and too much of an antioxidant is dangerous because oxidants have been developed by the body to help fight off infection okay so this actually uh, the body produces what are called superoxides uh to basically bust holes in the bug so if you don't have these oxides and you're mopping them all up with your antioxidants you run the risk of having problems so i think the old greek term and something that was basic to indian culture also moderation in all things is the key thank you hey murli i yeah, got I yes. one Prasad question uh, first of okay. all uh, you have given us enough uh, masala for discussing with my wife on my rounds <laughs> so much to discuss second thing you are, are you advocating fair and lovely also <laughs> why on earth no no, no. no but anyway no talk about life can but no i come to the more important thing <laughs> uh, this immunity booster that is being talked about now what are your thoughts on that i i just mentioned to prasad immune boosters have no real role no proven role and i'll give you one word of caution remember that the immune phase is because your immune system is overacting so if you have a very strong immune system an over strong immune system maybe it's going to cause you more harm than ever so having a healthy immune system is good there's no need to boost it beyond a certain point for most normal healthy people 
Thank you, Murli. Ravi. Okay. Uh, Ravi, Dr. Murli, that yeah. was one hell of a lucid presentation. Thank you. I honestly, I, I have not seen anything like this in quite some time. Thank you. Really. Uh, surprising bit was uh, you're mentioning that people with pulmonary vulnerability, oh, sorry, uh, with cardiac vulnerabilities have a, have a higher risk as compared to pulmonary ones. Okay, so that after two, two years of COVID, he suddenly realized that that is the truth. Okay, any other than exercise and diet, any anything that you think we should be conscious of, not to do, to do? So continue with your usual medications. As I mentioned, you know, if the sugar goes out of control, the BP goes out of control, the risk rises. Um, one of the things we've learned, and I mentioned this when I was talking about treatment, is budesonide, an inhaled steroid, is probably the reason why people with lung disease are actually doing surprisingly better. Whereas people with heart disease don't take it and they're at higher risk. You know, when this COVID-19 started in March of last year, uh, for India, it started in about March. That's when we were really worried. We thought our wards would be flooded with our patients. And strangely, our patients have not come in at all. You know, there are others who come in, uh, but Dr. Ishtiak will tell you the same. You know, his patients are actually at much less risk. Our patients are at much less risk. Uh, and one of the reasons attributed to this is, one, when they're very sick, they tend to be more careful. They tend to isolate. They tend to mask up. They take all the precautions. Whereas if they, uh, you know, are otherwise healthy, they tend to go out. But this doesn't explain why people with heart disease have greater risk. The other thing that happens is people with kidney disease maybe have a slightly suppressed immune system. And therefore, they don't go into the immune phase as much as people with normal immune systems. So I don't know if that's the explanation, but that's one of the possible explanations why, you know, people with lung disease do better because of the inhalers and with greater care, and heart disease don't do quite as well. Thanks, Murli. And I'm Hema's patient. Maybe that is the problem. I don't know. Okay, <laughs> Shirin. Uh, uh, mainly with, uh, you know, I have seen that post-COVID, people land up with urinary infection also, doctor. And especially in older people, once they get this urine infection, it's very difficult uh, uh, to go and the treatment and there's too much of restlessness. Uh, do you have any advice on this? So uh, I think the key is urine infection doesn't be occur because of COVID-19. Okay, let's be clear about that. Why it very often happens, especially in older people, is that they've been catheterized in hospital. If they've been at home and treated, I haven't really seen anybody get a urinary infection. If they get it, it's probably coincidental. But when they become sick and they go into hospital and they get a urinary catheter, that's when they're very, very likely to pick up an infection. The second is when they're in hospital, they tend not to empty the bladder frequently. And keeping your bladder full seems to increase the risk of infections. But we have two experts here who can tell you more about urinary infection and whether they are seeing more urinary infection. Uh, to some extent, uh, you know, I would invite uh, both of them rather than me to answer this. Saurabh Bhargav is the urologist, an extremely good urologist, and we have a master uh, nephrologist here who really handle this area. So Saurabh and uh, Ishtiak, if you all can add to that. But I, you know, what you should do from my side, I'll say, is. Keep yourself properly hydrated, not you. I mean, the elderly person gets properly hydrated. Visits the toilet frequently. When they are there, do double voiding. That is, very often people think they've emptied the bladder. They haven't. There's still a lot of residual urine. Empty the bladder. Stand there for a little while and try and pass a little more. Don't get obsessive about it, but make sure your bladder is empty. And if a person is being catheterized, that's when the problem happens. So let's try and avoid getting into that situation where a person needs catheterization. So... Saurabh, over to you. You're the expert. I think you're mostly absolutely right. You know, I don't think people get UTIs because of COVID. Uh, I have seen a few patients with scars on their kidney after COVID, and I think that's to do with, you know, the thrombus. But I think most of the people who do get UTIs after or during the time of COVID is because they are, you know, they are not moving around. And that's why, you know, I quite agree that people have to be as physically active as it is possible and feasible. 
and that really helps you know so if you are lying on the bed and not doing much you will be predisposed to things like you know all sorts of infections and that includes a urinary tract infection so uh, it's not it's not because they are uh, they they because of covid is why they are struggling it's because of the consequence of lying and being you know uh, not not moving around that people get predisposed to infections i think ishtiak may have something to add to it but uh, i think as i mean that is what it looks like to me what is happening these a lot these days Ishtiak, anything more to add? Ishtiak, anything more to add? Unmute yourself. Ishtiak, you're muted. I think. Where are you going? He's turned the video off. Okay, Sherin, anything else? Is that clear for you? Any yeah, other question? Uh, no, thank you so much. It was very informative and very useful. Thank you so okay. much, Dr. Murli and Dr. Sora. Thank you. Bini's got his hand raised. Bini, go on. Bini? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dr. Murli, you just made the arborites get up in the morning and walk along for exercise. You'll see hordes of them outside tomorrow walking after <laughs> hearing this. But I had a question. My question was, we witnessed a case uh, in emphasis recently where somebody who was uh, infected with COVID recovered and back to work, uh, a 35-year-old guy suddenly had a cardiac arrest last uh, Sunday and he passed away. Uh, and he had no history of heart problems, no history of any cardiac uh, issues. It was shocking uh, that that happened. What do you think would have been the reason? So one of the things we've learned about COVID fairly clearly is that it increases the risk of blood clots developing everywhere. Okay, so for those of you who recall your, uh, you know, school biology, we have arteries that end in capillaries and then become veins and the veins carry the blood back to the heart. And then you have two systems in parallel. One is a systemic sy 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 system which carries blood to the whole body. It comes back, it comes into the heart, gets pumped into the lungs, gets oxygenated. So we have the pulmonary system and the systemic system. Now in all these areas, blood clots can develop and it looks like the virus specifically targets the, apart from the uh, airways that I mentioned, also targets certain receptors which sit on the blood vessels. And that makes them more liable to clot. So in fact, one of the theories, and it seems a very convincing theory, is that the problems that happen in COVID happen because of blood clots. And the most blood clots are seen in the gotcha. lungs itself. And that is what leads to the lung damage, leads to the low oxygen, needs the person to go on a ventilator and all those kind of things. But you can also get clots everywhere, you know? So uh, we've seen clots in the brain. Um, you know, I'm sure Shibu has seen uh, people who come with unexpected strokes. And when we do their COVID test, this is very often in the late phase. So the RT-PCR test or the antigen test is negative but the antibody test is positive, telling us they've had an infection two or three weeks earlier. So it leaves this you know, high risk of clotting for at least a couple of weeks and maybe going on for six weeks to eight weeks or even three months. So one of the things we've learned is to initiate you know, blood thinners, and that's why I put it in the list of approved medications early. So we started very early and we carry it on in every phase and we carry it on even if the person gets discharged. So. Blood clotting seems to underlie a lot of these problems. I suspect this person had uh, that. My One of our secretaries, her brother, 35-year-old or 38-year-old, met with an accident, uh, fractured multiple bones, landed up in hospital. And in the hospital, before admission, it's routinely done that you do a COVID test. They found he was positive. But a guy had no COVID symptoms at all. Three days into hospital stay when they were getting him ready for surgery, uh, he had a massive stroke, you know, lost one half of his brain. 38, no previous problems, just the stroke, uh, you know. And I mean, the poor chap is pretty crippled with that, obviously, as you can see. And to live 38 at age 38, which, and this is not one. We've had multiple patients like this. 
So blood clotting probably explains this infosysian's, you know, unfortunate demise. And the tragedy okay. is you can be asymptomatic and still have it. <laughs> that is the big problem. That is why we believe that anybody in contact should be tested. Yeah. yeah. Anil, let over me, to you. Anil, your question. Here. Chandil, uh, Anil is, can, can, could you just raise your hand, on the hand icon, then I'll ask in turn. So Anil is okay. next. Okay. Anil, over to you. You yeah. can go ahead. Uh, thank you, doctor. That was a wonderful presentation. You know, I, I got some takeaways also in terms of how to build a slide from your presentation. Uh, you know, a couple of questions from me. Uh, you know, this third wave, they say it affects the children the most, you know, and that's what they say. And they say that in, in Brazil, it's been, it's been seen. So I just wanted to know your view on that. And if so, for children, is there anything else which we should do? Because, you know, ours, the children are still mingling with each other. So what is it that we should do? Number one, between this Covaxin or Covishield, uh, you know, which is the best, number two, and number three is say that if I take Covaxin uh, or Covishield, and then there is a window of, I guess now it is eight to 12 weeks. In between that window, if I get it, unfortunately, how severe uh, would that be? So these are my questions. Okay, so uh, the third question first, because I've forgotten the first two, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> is, no, I'll, I'll come back, I remember them now. So the third question is, you know, what happens if you get an infection? The risk certainly comes down of getting an infection. Uh, it's about 50 to 60%. With the new variants, they say it may be as low as 33%, but still you're 33% protected. The okay. infection, if a person gets it, tends to be milder. Again, it's not as good as having both doses of the vaccine, but it seems to provide some protection at least. The problem very often comes if the person takes the first dose or the second dose when they already have an infection. And we've seen this, this produces actually a massive reaction in terms of, uh, you know, the severe phase becomes very much more severe. And I think this is because people have taken the vaccine when they already are cooking an infection. So you get what is called an antibody mediated enhancement of the resp immune response, which is the later phase. Uh, and why this happens, I mean, why do people take it then is because somebody in the family has got an infection, they still feel okay. Remember, they may be asymptomatic or they may be in the incubation period. And at that time, they go and take the vaccine. It doesn't produce protection for at least two weeks, but it has increased their antibodies to just boost that seven to 10 day or 14 day uh, problem. So that's the reason why we strongly recommend that don't take a vaccine when somebody in the family is having an infection. Wait two weeks at least, make sure you're out of that incubation period before you take the vaccine. Then you can take the vaccine, it'll certainly produce protection. And uh, the other two questions, children, we are not yet in the third wave in India, as far as we can tell, uh, though Delhi may have been in it. Children are certainly getting affected more, but they still seem to be at lower risk than adults. The age is coming down, but still hasn't hit children. The reason why they suspect children or expect children may uh, have more severe disease in the third wave is because they're not vaccinated, okay? So none of the vaccines are yet approved for the under 18s. And that in my opinion is a mistake. We are actually trialing the Zydus uh, Cadilla vaccine, and that is gonna include children from the 12 to 18 group. Okay, so hopefully the 12 to 18, once that comes out, will get covered. And I think most people agree that it's ridiculous not to vaccinate children, and we probably should fast track their vaccination and not worry about what potential problems may arise out of the vaccination. What should the children do? I think they need to be a little more careful. I know the children are mingling unless they're all vaccinated and unless the group is small, I would recommend they use masks. It's very difficult for them to use masks. It's very difficult to enforce that on children, but I think for their own safety and for the safety of the grandparents. We know from our experience with influenza, and with pneumonia that the children actually get it. And in fact, this typically happens in first time school goers. They go to school, get an infection, come back and the grandfather falls ill or the grandmother falls ill with a bad pneumonia. The child recovers with very little problem and the grandfather ends up in the ICU. 
Okay, so which is why we vaccinate the elderly when it comes to pneumonia and uh, influenza. But very often the infection has been brought into the house by the child. And that's why the children need to be careful for their own selves and for the uh, adults in the house, especially the elderly in the house. One of the other problems that we're seeing with children is just like you have uh, adults getting this post-COVID. It's now called long COVID, but it can also be called multi multi-system inflammatory uh, COVID uh, syndrome of COVID in children. So it's called MISC for children and MISA for adults is something we are seeing in children. So they may have a mild infection to start with, but they have these long lasting problems and we don't know what effect it's going to have on them in the long run. COVID is a nasty condition, you know, so as far as possible till everybody gets vaccinated, we should maintain all precautions. And this COVID and Covaxin, doctor? I mean, uh, COVID and Covaxin, no difference. Uh, I personally think Covaxin is the better one because it provides a wide range. Uh, I mean, if this question comes up again, uh, how Covishield works is it, they've introduced a segment of DNA into an adenovirus, which is a cold virus. That virus goes into the body and infects the person who gets the vaccine. It transfers the DNA segment into the person's own cells. And this then produces the spike. This DNA is something that codes for the spike protein. So the person's own cells produce the spike protein and the body develops immunity against the spike protein and therefore is able to fight off the virus when it comes into the body. Okay. Fortunately, the virus they've chosen, not fortunately, by design, they've chosen the virus, which is a non-replicating virus. So it goes in once, but it cannot multiply. So it just goes in, infects and, and stops. That's a good thing. The problem is the second dose of the virus, the body may already have developed immunity against the adenovirus. So it may not allow the second dose to work optimally. So that is why, in my opinion, the Covaxin is likely to be better because it basically is a killed virus. It produces you know, antibodies against a whole variety of proteins that the virus has, therefore may be more effective. Even if the spike protein changes, it still be effective because it's covering you against other proteins in the virus. The uh, Russian virus, the Sputnik V, has been clever. They've used two different adenoviruses. So for the first dose, you have one adenovirus. For the second, you have a different adenovirus. And what happens is that the second time, you're not immune against, immune against the adenovirus you got the first time. So the second dose may still work. So I'm expecting actually the Sputnik V to be a little more effective than the COVID shield. So if you have a choice, I would take Covaxin. But if you have to wait, don't run the risk of picking up an infection in between. Take either vaccine. Both have extremely high efficacy rates. So whatever I told you is largely a theoretical problem. And that is probably why it works better if you postpone the second dose by three months for the COVID shield. Because by then the immune, you know, the antibodies you produced against the adenovirus have started to die down. So the second dose also works and works well. Whereas you take it too early, it may not work quite as well. Thank you, Dr. And, Thank and, you, in, the case, and think, in the case of Covaxin? The Covaxin is a killed virus, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, you know, you, you don't, you develop antibodies against the proteins that the virus produces. So, you know, you can get the second dose, it'll work even better. It'll produce what is called an immune boost. Okay. Alifia, your question. Uh, yes, uh, first of all, the presentation was absolutely excellent. I think uh, this is the most I've understood about this disease in the shortest time. So thank you so much for that. Um, actually, my grandmom uh, has, uh, I mean, she had COVID some time back and uh, she seems to have developed this, uh, you know, anxiety and, uh, you know, just forgetfulness. So I want to ask, what do we do to help her and how can, you know, how can she get out of this sooner? I'm going to pass that on to Pratima. Pratima is a psychiatrist. So Pratima, if you're listening, can you answer that? Unmute and answer, please. Anxiety and depression post-COVID. Yeah, I just wanted to say it's pretty common to have anxiety uh, post-COVID. Uh, but as Murli mentioned, you know, brain fogging is also something that's very commonly described. 
if it's not too severe and you know if she can uh, you know just uh, do some breathing exercises calming herself down and just monitor the cognitive deficits you should be okay uh, most things like are likely to recover as murli said in a few weeks to months but if it's severe obviously an evaluation is necessary and uh, you know further uh, treatment may be required but most often if it's mild you know these kind of very simple things will settle it down Mm, she seems to not be. I mean, she's forgetting that she's taken medicine. Oh, that's you know. the, yes. Then in, in that case, I would get a neurological evaluation done if it's okay. if it's significant, huh? and okay. I think it's important to do. Okay, fine, fine. So we'll probably get in touch with you afterwards. Thank you. I'll also send you a booklet uh, called Post COVID Info Pack, which it's useful to read. It has a variety of explanations. It's from the National Health Service. and it tells you how to handle some of these problems simple exercises to do including breathing exercises yoga pranayam helps a lot when i say pranayam i'm talking only about anulom vilom that helps a lot and they in the booklet talk about rectangular breathing which is exactly the same actually in terms of how you do it so if you can get her to do some of those are actually pretty calming they retrain the lungs into breathing more freely and more naturally So mm-hmm. I'll send it to you. I'll, in fact, I'll put it on the on the uh, Abbas group, so you right. can download it and read it. There's a slightly more complicated set of exercises from John Hopkins, Johns Hopkins. It's called Bouncing Back from COVID. That's also very good, but it's a little more elaborate. So I'll I'll put both on the group. I think both are very valuable. Thank you. Thank you so much. Raj, Raj Bhatia, Simran. Yeah. Uh, hi, Murli. Uh, thank you for guiding us through. Uh, difficult times and uh, yeah just one question i mean you've covered major part of it so that's useful to us uh, what are the chances of getting a relapse or getting infected again <laughs> after having recovered i'm going to be a little cruel here raj and i'm going to say okay. the fact <laughs> that you got infected tells us that you slipped up once and that's true of everybody who's got covid okay Okay. The problem is you need just one minor slip to get an infection because this is the highly infective virus and it's getting even more infective in the second wave. Okay. Uh and I'm I'm saying that only to, you know, remind you that you need to be on the alert all the time and keep taking precautions. You don't need to do anything else. You just need to do the standard four. Okay? Mask, preferably a double mask, hand washing and hand sanitization, so hand hygiene essentially. three take your vaccination not right now but when you get a chance to and for you it will be 8 to 12 weeks after your infection and uh, four is maintain physical distancing and if you can do those four your chances of getting an infection come down to virtually nil okay so since i i need to use a cricket uh, analogy because uh, you know there's so many cricket lovers in this group But this is some a cricket analogy that I love. It's like a batsman going with pads, abdominal guards, helmet, okay, and uh, you know, with all with these, you can expect to remain reasonably and gloves, of course. So you have four things, just like we have four items. And uh, I I always have difficulty recalling the fourth when I'm giving this example. Uh, but if you leave out any one of them, and you have you know malcolm marshall bowling at you uh, you're likely to get suffer severe injury if you have all four he'll probably hit you he'll probably and if you're a bad batsman like me you'll probably get hit in virtually every ball but you're unlikely to die you'll get hit but you won't die okay and that is the important thing to remember you have all four your chances of getting the infection is low and even if you get the infection the risk is low because you'll get a very low viral load and if you're already vaccinated that improves your you know that's why the uh, indian government which loves its its uh, you know these fancy names called it the covid kavach so it is like literally a suit of armor that you're wearing apart from that more important thing is you're already protected certainly for the next 3 months you seem to be highly protected and if you can boost that with your vaccine and honestly i think covid is here to stay we are going to have like influenza we're going to have an annual vaccine because the virus is going to keep changing can remember to take your annual vaccination your risk is going to be very low and like the japs and the koreans we're probably going to have to use masks when we go out in public forever 
And we don't have to worry about that with small groups. The US has already lifted its you know, recommendation against always wearing a mask, saying if you're in small groups, you're in open spaces, you don't need to wear a mask if everybody is vaccinated. And hopefully we'll get to that stage fairly soon. Okay. Uh, so just, just one more quick question. The infection are like about 3%. Okay, ninety-seven percent. You're not going to have an infection. Okay, we took our first dose on April eighth, and I tested positive on April twenty-third. So when should I take the second dose? When should we take the second dose? Take it eight weeks at least after your infection. Eight after to the infection, after so the twenty-third of that, April, you'll still be producing adequate antibodies. So you'll still be okay. The later you take it, the longer the protection will last. Because that's okay. when you'll get a okay. nice big boost and it'll last for probably six months. You take it too soon, it'll run out in six months. So we don't okay. know after that how long it's going to be really effective. So just take comfort in the fact that you are protected for the next eight weeks at least. So take it after that. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I just Chendil, have a Chendil, uh, I think Chendil, has a question. Uh, yeah. Chendil, you had a question. I, I, I you do can... have a question. No, no, sir. Okay, Sibu, can I... go ahead. Yeah, sorry, yeah, okay, sorry. go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, uh, no, no. Uh, it, uh, um, uh, I just wanted to ask uh, if there are any kinds of symptoms that happen if uh, there is any clotting that has happened or there is any uh, chance of any kind of a stroke. Are there any kind of symptoms that the body uh, tells you that you have to look up for? Anything at all? So by and large, if you, have sim if you have a clot anywhere, it shows up almost immediately. Because what happens is the clot blocks off the blood supply to that particular part. And it can show up as one of many symptoms depending on which part is blocked off. So for example, if, the, if there's an artery going to the brain that gets blocked off, the person has a stroke. And that shows up almost immediately as the loss of some nerve function. You know, Some part of the brain shuts off that little bit. Uh, most often you'll know that something has gone wrong. So for example, if the blood clot to the uh, arm, this patient I told you about who had a stroke, uh, also clotted off one of his arteries going into the arm. And that is completely blocked off. The arm immediately turns pale, it's painful, and it's paralyzed. Okay, so those, and of course, when we feel it, there's no pulse on it. Okay, so it shows up almost immediately. Chances of having a silent stroke are there, but they're extremely small. It can clot off in the lungs, but almost always the person will become breathless, get palpitations and so on. And this persists. You know, what Alifia spoke about, anxiety can also produce palpitations, a fast heart rate. And just a fast heart rate is very, very common post-COVID. It's part of the post-COVID syndrome without actually producing any problems. So important thing is don't panic. While I spoke about clots as being as underlying it. Remember that I told you more than 80% of people don't even have any symptoms uh, or have very mild symptoms and recover with absolutely no problems. And the other clot related symptoms probably happen in less than 10%. And you'll know if you have a clot generally. Okay, so there's no point in going running around looking for it, but it may make sense to use a blood thinner for three to six weeks. In people with risk, we extend it sometimes to three months. And after that, the risk of having a clot is virtually nil. Okay. okay. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, okay. Thanks. Anything you, else, Simran? You mentioned no, they would that's know that's that there is a clot. Did you did you say that? Yes. How would they know? By I mean, the doctors example, would know. For example, if it's the heart, the person you mentioned would have had some chest pain, and very often people ignore it. Okay. 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 So you can have what is called a sudden cardiac death where the person just goes like that. I mean, that is very unfortunate. It can happen to anyone. Okay. okay, but that's extremely rare. You know, it can happen to anyone, COVID or no COVID. Okay. So, that so, case uh, uh, seemed to me like it was a pulmonary embolus. No? So he might actually have just a sudden chest pain and then die. Absolutely. So, yeah. So that's a thought which goes into the arteries. Uh, into and the that's arms. very unfortunate, but very rare. So it, we do come across these and it's it's oh. the tragedy of COVID and can it can happen in other conditions. It's not restricted to COVID. Shibu, uh, any other any? comment or question yeah. about the clots? You'll remember Anything that uh, what's his name? Uh, Steve Waugh had a clot, so-called economy class syndrome. So did, uh, you know, what's her name? Um, the famous uh, sister, not, not Venus, I'm not getting... Uh, 
Serena, uh, Serena. Serena. Serena Williams had a clot. Okay, so it's a fairly common thing to get leg clot. Most people survive it, but an unfortunate few die suddenly. Shibu, Mumbai, sir, do you want to say something about the clot or a question later? I'll... No, I have a question. Shall I get back to you after I intern? Yeah, yeah. Chen yes. Chendil is next. Yeah, I'll get back to you. Chendil is next. I also have a question. Chendil, you're muted. You're muted, Chendil. Thanks, doctor. I think uh, uh, thanks for taking your time. It was very insight. Uh, because I know nowadays we get too many WhatsApp and it confuses a lot. I think it was, I mean, the clarity was very good. This related in terms of the clot itself, right? You know, we talked about, you know, the thinners, right? So there are a lot of people who are already on blood thinners, you know? Yeah. So, so what happens to them then, you know, when they are already, you know, on a blood thinner? So we think that they actually have a lower risk of developing complications of COVID. There are a few okay. studies which have shown that reasonably well and support this theory that we've had. So the problem is, you know, a lot of, if you, if you speak to the Americans, the Americans believe nothing works. Okay. And that's because they are stuck to using strong evidence done in randomized control trials. They have a lot of jargon that goes along. In the COVID pandemic, we haven't had the time to generate that kind of evidence. So a lot of the time we've had to go with what is the science underlying it? Does it make sense to use this? And so what you're describing, somebody who's already on blood thinners of various kinds, the associative studies, which are considered a dirty word in evidence-based medicine, you say, you know, if you have, if you're already on a blood thinner, you have a lower risk. If you're not on a blood thinner, you have a higher risk. It's considered not very good science. But we know that that happens. And therefore, two things about it. We know that blood thinners do work. And two, when a person is on a blood thinner, they should stay on it. They should not withdraw it, whatever the oh. reason. You can escalate the level of blood thinner, but don't stop it suddenly. That's extremely important. Thank you. Most, yeah, thank you. All our patients on blood thinners. Most all. BP guys are anyways on blood thinners. Uh, many, not all. In fact, it's probably not a good idea if a person has no evidence of, you know, blockages of vessels to start a blood thinner because there the benefit is very low and the risk of having a bleed within the brain or somewhere else is quite high. Okay. okay so whenever we start a blood thinner, we have to we weigh up what are the risks of taking it, what are the benefits of taking it. Only when the benefits are far above the risk, then we prescribe it. In COVID, it seems that the benefits far outweigh the risks, but we still will do a risk-benefit analysis. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Revati, you're next. Revati, your question. Yeah. Uh, doctor, this is... Um, I've uh, seen two cases of people uh, who have had the vaccine and for no reason have, after two to three weeks, have developed a stroke or found clots. Uh, is there anything associated with the vaccine itself after having the first mm -hmm. dose? So they have described clotting with Covishield and it looks like it is a real effect. We don't know whether it's the adenovirus carrier that we spoke about. We don't know whether it's the spike protein, whether too much of the spike protein is triggering off the clotting. Um, so while it produces protection, it may also produce an increased risk of clotting. It's a small risk. And if you compare it against the background risk of clotting after developing COVID, it's minuscule. But it is probably true that, uh, you know, the uh, Covishield and the Pfizer vaccines, but especially Covishield or the AstraZeneca vaccine, does increase the risk of developing a clot a little. Does that mean you shouldn't take the vaccine? No, it doesn't. Uh, but what I have started doing is making sure that if the person has a high risk for developing clots, we start them on a blood thinner also. Initially, people who were on blood thinners were not being given vaccination. And that, in my opinion, is wrong. Okay? All you need to do after you... Anybody who's on a blood thinner, you know, if you take the vaccination, just maintain very tight pressure on the area for about 10 minutes after you've taken the vaccine. And that's all that you need. The risk is that there may be bleeding from the site if you're on a blood thinner. And if you just maintain pressure for 10 minutes, it overcomes that risk and provides all the necessary protection. But yes, to go back to your question, there is a small increased risk of clotting but this is much less than the background risk of clotting in the population. 
and much lower than the risk of clotting after COVID because COVID operates through clotting. So we think that a small number of people, because the vaccine in some way replicates the, you know, the way the virus does its work, is lays them open to a small risk of clotting. We can't hear you, Revati. We can't hear you. Hello. Hello. You, yeah, better. Your voice is weak. Hello. Yeah. yeah. Go, go ahead. Yeah. So, if a person has had some kind of clotting and then it has, uh, through some medication, it has resolved itself over time, uh, should that person take the second dose or not take the second dose? I would say don't take the second dose. Because, because we have not been able to correlate. We, know, we don't know why it happened out of the blue. That, that's the problem. But if it happened two to three weeks after, you know, receiving it, uh, you know, probably the risk is a little low as, I mean, I'm sorry, the association with the vaccine is probably a little low. Typically, it happens in the second week after taking it. Between four days and 14 days is when it seems to happen. And very typically, it's associated with the drop in the platelet count. That's typically what happens. And that's when we know it's associated with the vaccine. If it happened without that and it happened very late, then it's probably just something that is coincidental. If it happened in a very young person, I would be deeply suspicious. If it happened in somebody who's in their 60s or 70s, then we know the background chance of that person having a clot, a stroke, or a heart problem is quite high already. So I would probably be happy to give them the second dose or just wait for about three months and then give them the second dose and okay. cover them with anti-clotting medication, which anyway have been started by them because of the first clot. Thank you. Nir okay, Nirmal, your question. Hi, Doctor. Uh, Hi. First, thank you for such a interesting presentation. I yeah. actually have two questions. The first one is, how effective are uh, you know these traditional methods like um, steam inhalation? to avoid, in avoiding, uh, you know, infection. Maybe uh, I'll, uh, the second question is not connected to this, so I will, I'll let you answer this, then I'll... I say that there is absolutely no evidence that stimulation works, absolutely none. And uh, one of my good friends, a pulmonologist from Manipal Hospital, is describing to me a couple who were over-enthusiastically steaming themselves like they were idlis, and ended up with a lot of burns in the throat and nose and, and the food pipe. Okay, and that would actually increase the risk of infection because there's local damage. Okay, so there's absolutely no evidence that steam works. Uh, there's absolutely no evidence that putting lime juice in your nostrils work as one of our famous politicians said. Uh, you know, all those don't really work. So they actually add to the complications rather than, um, you know, helping at all. So steam, definitely no, no. If you want to, after you've got COVID and you use gentle steam to release the thick mucus, sometimes the nose dries up and so on, that may have a benefit. I think Ishtiak wants to say something. Uh, this is regarding... Ishtiak, this, you want uh, to say something? Yeah. Hello? Yeah. So this is regarding the steam. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. In fact, one of the reasons uh, which is uh, proposed now for increased mucor mucosis is because of excessive steam inhalation now. So that causes uh, nasal damage, mucosal damage, and that increases the risk of mucormycosis. It's better to avoid uh, too much of steam now. Absolutely agree. Uh, mucormycosis commonly, you know, in the papers is called black fungus. Now we are seeing an unusual number of it and absolutely right. That's one of the reasons I think personally, and I think Ishtayak agrees, steam is responsible. People, you know, doing too much of it. I think like everything else in moderation, Yes. Is okay. Yeah. yeah but Overdoing it or too much steam is like uh, bad, like anything else. Can we use the steaming at all? I wouldn't recommend it, honestly. I don't think it does anything. As I said, you can use it, as Shibu just said, in moderation. And by the way, I'd be grateful if everybody called me by my name. I'm embarrassed to be called doctor by, you know, neighbors. Uh, <laughs> so if, you know, please, please call me by my name. But uh, steaming... Risk is, if you don't know how much steam to take, uh, it just raises your risk without any benefits. But gargling with the salt water and all? 
gargling with salt water should be okay because you spit it out and there's no damage caused. Okay. okay. Will and it prevent I, infection? Will see, it prevent uh, infection? No. Oh. No. It's not going to prevent infection. So basically what it does is it soothes the throat. If you have a badly inflamed throat, then using, you know, something which is like salt water may help to soothe it a little. Apart from that, it does nothing. But, it, you know, if you feel soothed with it, that's fine. Uh, please make sure it's not very hot water because uh, that can cause a lot of damage. And uh, I don't think steam honestly helps. Nirmal, your second question. One of the things yeah. that people are doing also is they're doing nasal douching or douching which is using, uh, you know, something like Jalneti. Again, you need to be caref careful when you're using Jalneti, though it's beloved of people, that the water you use is not contaminated. So, for example, please don't use salt water, uh, tap water, because that in India is loaded with bacteria. There's a particular kind of bacterium called atypical mycobacteria, which is related to TB, which can cause nasty problems. And that's ubiquitous in... Um, in uh, water tanks and storage devices for water. Uh, there are some which especially accumulate in hot water de devices like geysers and so on. And that's quite a big problem. In fact, in the West, they call it hot tub syndrome, which is associated with, uh, you know, reactions to these bugs. And there is a kind of uh, people who are fans of Dr. House will know there's a kind of uh, amoeba, which enters the brain and can cause a brain infection, which is also found in water and which has entered, at least according to a few anecdotal reports, through Jalneti. So please be careful about using Jalneti. I'm not <laughs> saying it's not helpful, but it has to be done with absolutely clean water. Sterile water. Yeah. Nirmal, you have a second question? Yeah, the second question I had was, um, see, we see a lot of uh, new products coming into the market. Um, uh, for example, there's this, uh, what is it, electron emitters, uh, which have been uh, brought into the market by Eureka Forbes. They say that, you know, since air conditioned office spaces or even concealed, I mean, uh, areas like in your house have a lot of chances where you, you can actually get infected. So they, these, these machines produce, I think, positively charged uh, or electro, uh, negatively charged uh, uh, electrons where, wherein the uh, viruses will get attached to it and it reduces, you know, chances of infection. Are these really, I mean, is this true or uh, do, are these effective? Honestly, I don't think it works. There are good studies which show that there's absolutely no role. Uh, I don't know if there are any physicists in this group, but apparently electrons can't travel the kind of distances claimed. Uh, the inventor of the Shyokan thing, which I think Eureka Forbes has bought over, uh, I, I've met him. I was planning to collaborate on something with him, but I found you know, he rushes into the market without any evidence at all. Uh, he's a brilliant person, but I don't think there's enough background work that has gone into it. And whatever little work I know, it doesn't, doesn't seem to do anything. All right. Thank you. Muttu, sir, you wanted to ask something. Yeah, Doc, first of all, it's a brilliant presentation. And that is the clearest I've heard on the subject of life in the last two years. Thank you, sir. I have uh, two questions. One is, uh, is there something in terms of behavioral change of human beings? Is there something that is permanently going to happen post-COVID or uh, life is going to get back to normal? That is one. Secondly, is there any uh, issue in science or medicine that needs to be worked much more and that will show some direction for the future for the world? Is there anything of that nature that is beginning to happen in the in the uh, industry? So I, I think to answer the first question, I think the behavior of some people is going to change forever. I think life as we know it has changed and will continue to change. But I think for a large number of people, it's like nothing has happened. You go out and you see they're not wearing masks. They're, you know, we have intelligent people. Well, I wouldn't say intelligent, but educated people who seem not to follow any precautions, uh, mingling, not wearing a mask. Uh, we just had this experience of 130 people going in a plane without masks and thinking they're safe because they're up in the sky. So in some people, behavior is not going to change. Uh, some people, it is going to change dramatically. 
For most people, it is going to change to some extent is my feeling. We're already seeing that in the community. Uh, hopefully we can get significant behavioral changes. Part of it is cultural, as I mentioned earlier. So the Far East, they already seem to have this culture of being clean. And, you know, this is not new. It's, it's come in their culture for a very long time. Uh, and hopefully we will move into that here in India where we are personally clean, but we have no sense of public cleanliness. Regarding changes that are happening, I think, you know, one of the things that are going to change is I think people are going to invest more in health. Uh, hopefully, we've learned our lesson and health budgets will increase, budgets of research will increase and the governments will get, governments around the world, I'm not blaming any one government, uh, you know, I think you know better than me that the health budget for our country, whichever government is in power has been minuscule and hopefully it'll go up a little. And unless you have enough support, financial and otherwise, I don't think big changes are going to be made. Uh, and this is true around the world. And I, I, hopefully, you know, with this relaxation of or waiver of patents, we will see some changes in world trade organization associated things for emergencies and so on, which I think is a necessity. There's a difference between preserving one's patents for some things and loosening it at times of necessity. And I think that needs to happen. So those are the only two major changes I see happening, sir. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Uh, Ravi, Ravi Chandar. Hi, good evening, Murli. <clears throat> very informative and very useful speech or uh, session. Uh, I wanted to clarify one thing. One of my colleagues, uh, Vinith and mine and Anil, uh, he had insomnia. He couldn't sleep for six days continuously. And every day he was getting more and more tired, but he, he just couldn't sleep even for 15, 20 minutes. Then somebody known to him, some doctor friend in Bombay told, why don't you go and get tested? And uh, he tested positive, his wife tested positive, and they were asymptomatic otherwise. And uh, he got admitted in the neck of the moment. moment and uh, <clears throat> he had to be hospitalized for 10 days. The doctor said, if you had come two days late, you would have been a ventilator patient. I believe 70% of his lung was damaged. His pulse oximeter reading was all okay. He got admitted. So have you seen and another colleague actually got insomnia post-COVID? So have you seen cases like this? Uh, is that one of the symptoms? So it's not a very common symptom, but yes, I have seen patients. Now, most of these are in patients who have already been diagnosed as having COVID. So we've never known whether it's anxiety related to the COVID or it's a part of the COVID itself. Because we know anxiety is a big problem. Post-COVID, post-traumatic stress is one of the things, you know, people have gone through this. What in their minds is a life-threatening experience. So they, a lot of people do panic. We have a chap in the ward now who's, who's gone completely crazy. Uh, he refused to come out of the loop for almost three hours today and had to be persuaded out. And there's a man whose father and brother died in the, of COVID in the last month. So obviously you can understand why he's so tense. He, does, he says he didn't sleep the whole of last night, but this is all post-COVID. Uh, but I know people have complained. I've never known anybody in whom COVID was the uh, was diagnosed based on insomnia, but uh, I don't see why it can't happen. As I said, it can affect specific parts of the brain, so you can get this isolated specific neurological deficit, uh, and insomnia can easily be one of those. Okay. It can also be due to the medications people get. So, for example, we start people on steroids in the later phases, and steroids, we know, especially they're given at night, can keep people away. So there are multiple reasons why it may happen. Uh, one of the other things that I need to speak about from what you said is he was asymptomatic and then needed to spend 10 days in hospital is this condition called happy hypoxia. So you can't rely on breathlessness. We've had patients who, you know, this first was described to me by a former student of mine who's now practicing in Oman. And he said, you know, they, they got it much earlier than us. So he was telling me that he used to walk down the ward and see people chatting with each other. And on the way back, he just happened to look at the person's oxygen monitor and it was 70%. And in the next 10 minutes, this person died. You know, chap who was happily talking to his neighbor. And that's the problem. When the oxygen drops, what's called hypoxia, very often people are happy. They don't know that their oxygen is low. They don't even feel the sense of breathlessness. 
somebody who's, for example, got an asthmatic attack and it drops to 85, 88% is severely breathless. So this is a peculiar phenomenon, peculiar to COVID-19. We call it happy hypoxia, and that's something we need to be aware about, which is the other reason I ask patients to carefully monitor their oxygen every six hours at rest from the exercise and not rely on their breathlessness. Okay, my next question is, see, we've stopped this house health gardener and all that. I have my mother is 85 plus and she's been with us right through. So I wanted to know, I know Shibu and uh, Saurabh and Ishtiag have been guiding us regularly. Uh, I wanted to know uh, how safe it is whenever we open up to get the maid inside the house because we stopped the maid by April 1st week, second week. And we've also stopped them. You know, I was a little brave in the beginning, but with the second wave, I decided uh, it was not right uh, when you have elderly people at home, uh, especially, but for virtually anybody is given the second wave. I would say it's safe when they've been vaccinated. So encourage them to get vaccinated and then you can take them back. But even after vaccination, they need to wear a mask and you need to wear a mask when they're in the house. Okay. Because yes. if it's a maid who works in five houses, her chances of getting an infection rise fivefold. Okay, you can't blame them. They have to make their living. So they will keep going to multiple houses. Their understanding of the need to mask up and to take all these precautions is very low. Half of them are pulling their mask down to their chin while you're not looking. Uh, I have patients walk into my OPD, educated people, and every time I ask them a question, they pull the mask down to talk and then pull it back up. So, you know, you can't rely on them to... So, encourage them to stay wearing a mask, preferably a double mask. Family members wear a double mask when they are in the house and encourage them, help them to get vaccinated. That's the only way to manage this. Okay, thank you. Yeah. In fact, my 80-year-old uncle... And I would completely took... agree with Saurabh and, uh, you know, the others for saying keep them out because in a gated community, it can also spread very rapidly. It's a big nightmare in flats because there's some talk of it spreading through fecal transmission and when you flush, you know, uh, poop aerosolizes basically... And it can be excreted in the poop for two, three weeks after recovery, unlike the lungs, which settle down fairly quickly. So that's why, you know, I think ours is a wonderful, safe place, wonderfully safe place compared to the, you know, high rise apartments. So all of you in ours, thank yourselves for taking this decision. But uh, it's still not a zero risk. No, but is the apartment story correct? I don't know, but it has been shown in poop. In fact, that's one of the ways that they believe that tracking spread in the community. So you get a like a cross section if you just collect sewage water and check it for viruses. There are some people who believe that's a way of telling how much infection there is in the community and what is the risk of having variants, mutants in the community by just assessing rather than looking at individual patients. So it just happened in my other apartment in others. C101, 201, 301, 501, right up to 901. Only that particular apartment, uh, I, I mean, the series people got infected. 102, 34, nobody got infected. Exactly. So I think that's strong. It was three days old. I saw the, the group and they were trying to analyze why it's happening. So that's one of the theories. Not proven, but I think what you're telling me is, you know, supportive. Of no, no, this theory didn't come from there, but. They were wondering, you know, messages keep going back. Nobody knew what was happening. <laughs> yeah. Ramesh, was your question answered or uh, because you have lowered your hand? Ramesh? Okay, we'll uh, move to Sri Kumar. Sri Kumar, go ahead. Ramesh is more boy. So, thank you for your so informative man. session. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Go yes. ahead. Go ahead, Sri Kumar. We can hear Thank you. Thank you for your informative session. Thanks this is regarding my mother. After six months, she is having palpitation and anxiety. Could be connected to the COVID which she had six months back. Could be. Uh, two things or three things I would say could explain it. One is, you know, the anxiety that accompanies post-COVID can go on for six months. And in fact, as Evidence accumulates, it may stretch even to nine months and a year. So it could just be anxiety. The second possibility is that, uh, you know, it's, it does, in a small number of people, weaken the heart. 
the virus attaches itself to the heart, so it produces inflammation of the heart muscle. It's called myocarditis, and that we know can happen. It can also, as we said, produce clots which weaken the heart. So we need to check the heart out, and that's important, because especially if it okay. affects what is like the wiring of the heart, what is called the conduction system of the heart, it can produce these rhythm disturbances, which show up only as palpitations. And the third reason this could happen is it seems to affect what is called the autonomic system, which controls all the organs in the body. It will speed up the heart and another part of it slows down the heart. You know, so you, you've all heard of the sympathetic and the parasympathetic system, uh, adrenaline and so on. So this can get affected in COVID. And that is what is responsible for these episodes of temperature change, sudden palpitations, we learned it fairly early when one of our former postgraduates who fell ill with COVID in Vishakhapatnam developed COVID, then he wanted to come back and be cared for us because, you know, the three years they spend with us as postgraduates, they get a lot of faith in the team. So he came back from Vishakhapatnam, spent time with us. And while his infection settled rapidly, he developed palpitations, heart rate would suddenly speed up. And this is a very anxious person to start with. We dismissed it as anxiety in the beginning because we know he's very anxious. But then we did a MR cardiac scan and it showed that he had some inflammation of the heart muscle which was settling down it settled down now finally uh, he unfortunately got a second attack despite having his vaccinations but this is because he's a gastroenterologist now he's a you know he gets exposed to a lot while doing bronch uh, endoscopies uh, so i think okay. he picked up a second infection but he's okay. done very well he's recovered from both with no residual effects but these episodes of palpitation remain and I think that's the auto autonomic system in him that has gone a little out of whack. And that's why he's developing these episodes. He's adjusted to it. He's not so anxious okay. about it now. But that may be the explanation in her. But okay. I think it's important, especially as she's older, okay. to get the heart checked out. Yeah. Heart check. Okay. Fine. Thank you very much. Thank you. Pleasure. Bye. Ashok. Yeah, thank you, uh, doctor. Really uh, informative. My question was about the double masking. You mentioned about the double masking where we have a disposable on the inside and cloth on the outside. What if I were to use a double cloth mask? Is that effective? Yeah, yeah that's also effective. The important thing is to get a seal and to have multiple layers. Now, the advantage with the disposable surgical mask it is, is it has two or three layers. And it's made in such a way, and this is important when you put on one of these surgical masks to know how exactly you should use it. It's got an outer surface which is non-absorbent and the inner layer is absorbed. Right. Okay, now if you wear it the other way, it's not going to help you. It's going to be uncomfortable to wear actually. But more importantly, if somebody is speaking, their droplets will come and get absorbed onto the absorptive outer surface. So when you use one of these disposable masks, some people use a color change, but the best way to find out which way to wear it is to have the folds pointing downwards. Okay, right. so the, the, it has a fold, so the folds point downwards, that should be outside. And the folds pointing upwards are on the inside. Okay, so that ensures that you have the right surfaces. Now, Thank you. what that does is it enables you to pull it down below the chin, but it still doesn't produce a very good seal. With a cloth mask, you usually have only one layer. So if you have a double mask, two layers of cloth, it does produce two layers, but perhaps it doesn't have all the benefits that the, uh, you know, one disposable and one cloth mask give you, but that's okay. Equally important when you're wearing a cloth mask, people leave it lying around. Um, and, you know, there it falls on surfaces, absorbs stuff from the surface, and then you put it with that surface on the inside. So even when you're using a cloth mask, please make sure that you know which is the outer surface and the inner surface. You keep them constant, what stays in and what stays out. And when you take it off, please make sure it's stored carefully and not just lying around on tables and chairs and drops on the floor and so on. Uh, and it's got to be washed frequently. Uh, right. One of the theories that has come forward for this black fungus issue is whether, you know, fungus is growing in a mask and we keep using a mask too often without either changing it or washing it. What about N95 masks? N95 masks are good, but even those have to be recycled. N95 masks are honestly pretty difficult to wear. In the beginning of this pandemic, I used to struggle. If it's really working well, you've got a good tight seal, it becomes very difficult to use. After about three hours, you desperately want to pull it off. 
Can we watch the 1095? Under, we've learned how to use it and I keep it on throughout these days. But even then, when I get back to my room and I'm alone, I take it off immediately. You cannot wash an N95 mask. No, you cannot. No, no, no. Cannot iron. I learned that when I tried, you know, right in the first day when I tried to iron an uh, ordinary surgical mask, it melted. These are basically plastic. So as Shibu was saying, you cannot wash, you cannot sterilize it anyway. You've got to dispose of it. And by the way, in fact, another lesson. Yeah. In fact, as soon as it becomes. Sorry, Shibu, go ahead. In fact, as soon as it becomes wet with your saliva or moisture, you should actually discard it. So, because the inner material actually gets uh, deteriorates when it's become moist. So, once so it becomes wet, we have to use it after one use. So, that would be ideal. But if you're going to recycle it, you leave it hanging in the sun in a closed area at least for three to four days, and then you can reuse it. We cannot so, wash at all. Don't no washing. And maximum or, you should reuse it is maybe four or five times at the most. Or UV. Four or five days maximum. And you don't can, use it continuously. Every day continuously you should not be used. If you use it today, hang it for three or four days in the sun, let it dry out completely, then you can reuse it. You can UV it. What the, uh, All India Institute people said was you buy five N95 masks, have five paper envelopes, after you use it, put it into, into envelope one, which you mark clearly. Next day, you use envelope the mask in envelope two, and so on. So after five days, you come back to mask one. So it's at least had five days, four days in between, sitting in this uh, porous envelope. So it has a chance to dry out if you're not putting it in the sun. And as Shibu was saying, try not to use it more than four times. Okay, because okay thank you very much. And certainly no washing, no ironing. I heard UV light probably doesn't work. There's no evidence that UV light is effective, mainly because you, it's very difficult to focus the UV light on the inside of a mask and be sure it's covering it completely. So a part which is in the shadow of the UV light probably doesn't get sterilized. So you've got to be very careful. I, I don't know of any UV light thing that is able to uh, adequately sterilize an irregular surface. No, because now we have that thing with the reflector in the bottom and the lights from the side. And yeah, the whole still, you, know, you get a shadow because the N95 mask is like a dome or a duck beak. Those are the two descriptions, duck bill and dome. They, you can never be sure you've got a complete uh, okay. solution. Uh, Ali, did you have a question? Ali is gone, I think. Okay. So one more I question, think, doctor. Okay, Ramesh. Uh, see, I have seen many medicos who have taken uh, two doses of vaccine and get infected after a, a sufficient time, three, one month and all, and especially in medical colleges, PG students and all. How do you explain that? So, as I mentioned earlier, a vaccine does not provide 100% protection against infection. It provides very, very high, close to 100% protection against serious disease. So we should need to be fairly clear about the difference between infection and disease. There's a small number of, there are two things that happen after a person has received both doses of the vaccine. There's a false sense of security. So they throw caution to the winds, they're not using their mask properly. And you know, that's a problem. Uh, the second thing that happens is not everybody develops proper protection. For example, I have never, I've taken five doses of hepatitis B vaccine and my antibodies against hepatitis B are zero. I've just not been able to develop uh, immunity against hepatitis B uh, despite five doses. So we know that there are some people who will not develop a proper uh, immune response. We don't know if that doesn't provide protection because there are two kinds of immunity. There's what is called cell-mediated immunity or T-cell-based immunity, which does seem to get activated even if the antibody immunity doesn't get activated and what is usually checked is the antibody mediated immunity. Okay, so do people get infections? Yes, people get infections. Do people get severe infections? No, they don't get severe infections. They get mild infections. There are a lot of asymptomatic infections, which is why you need to take all precautions because people who are vaccinated can still carry infection home to unvaccinated people. But the viral load is low the chances that they will give a serious infection even to other people at home is low. 
And the more people that get vaccinated and the sooner we reach what is called herd immunity, the better it is for the community. So the chance of getting transmitted from one to the other comes down. Thank you. Sir. That's what we're aiming for, herd immunity. Thank you very much. So I think we've come to pretty much the end of our session. I think no more questions. I don't see any more raised hands. So thank you very much, Murli. That was a yeah. fantastic. Shibu, can I just make one important point? Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, which Sharanya reminded me, she's sitting here. She said, when you dispose of masks, be careful how you dispose of them because the people who are clearing them are at risk if your mask has somehow picked up an infection. So please follow you know, precautions, it's got to be treated like medical waste and disposed of carefully. Okay. Yeah, I think so sort of summarizing the yeah, whole thing, I think the key to the whole... The other thing, the other yeah. thing yeah. Yeah. is snap off the ear loops or the things because unfortunately they're picked up from waste and recycled which you don't want. Yeah, yeah, that's that's important, yeah. So, uh, like... Ramesh, yeah? Yeah, I would like, like to thank uh, Dr. Murli. I have, this is a, the best explanation and uh, uh, presentation I have ever heard about uh, COVID-19 for the thank last you, two Dr. years. Yeah, I think uh, Dr. Murli deserves a thank you, really thank you. good ovation for that. And uh, let me just summarize what he said. The key, I think, is prevention. So we all need to continue with mask, hand wash, and care when we meet each other. So especially gatherings, eating and drinking together in closed spaces are something we should absolutely avoid. A lot of people coming together should be absolutely avoided. And we have to fight our itch. And that's the word uh, Saurabh described it as, the itch to get together and meet up and gang up and party once more. That itch should be suppressed for at least another year, let us continue to be careful. So precaution is the key. We have to get ourselves and our maids and people working with us vaccinated. But remember, even after vaccination, you can still get infected. Even after getting COVID infection, you can still get infected after that, subsequently as a second infection. So all of us, irrespective of what our status, we need to continue wearing the mask, continue being careful, to protect ourselves and the people around us. So that is the key. And let us all try to be careful. Let us all try to protect our neighbors and our family. So thank you once again, uh, Murli. That was fantastic. And uh, thank you, everybody, for taking part in this. Murli, that was really so good. Actively. Fantastic it was. Thank you, Dr. Murli. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, by Dr. the way, Murli, I want to ask you one last question. Are you, have you noted down how many minutes you have talked to each one of us? You are going to invoice us? <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Uh, Absolutely brilliant. Uh, Dr. Dr. Murli, you are awesome. You are just too good. Just, just amazing. Amazing. So thank you so much. So, thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you, Murli. Thank you, thank you, thank you Dr. Murli. Thank okay. you. I think we can go. Thank you, Dr. Shibu. Dr. Murli, we would yes, feel thank safe. Thank you, Dr. Shibu. We will feel safer if you come and live here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. You All right. mean to say you don't feel safe with me and Shibu and... <laughs> uh, he, he, <laughs> you, know? you are in he, trouble. <laughs> he, used, he used his words carefully. He <laughs> said safer, Saurabh. Safer. <laughs> that means he's safe. He wants to be safer. <laughs> he, he, he's a master at using the right word. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Let's Thank you, everybody. go enjoy Thank your you. dinner. Thank Good you. night, everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, right. you. Thank, you. Thank you, Dr. Shibu. Shibu, thanks. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shibu.